because this is not the first time that the Global Protection Cluster has turned to this subject. In the 2010 Handbook on the Protection of IDPs, we have a chapter uh, specifically on this subject of humanitarian evacuations. And in 2014, we held a thematic round table also on this subject, and you can find the report of that round table on our website at globalprotectioncluster.org. Thankfully, humanitarian evacuations are a relatively rare occurrence, and the most notable recent examples are from the Central African Republic and uh, more commonly now in Syria. But there are, of course, older examples, and as I'm from the United Kingdom, we have in our folk memory the relocation of children from urban to rural areas during the Second World War. But more recently, of course, there is the relocation of populations during the conflicts in former Yugoslavia. The need for an, a humanitarian evacuation underlines a generally grave situation for the protection of human rights in an armed conflict. So I'm going to turn to the panel now and to ask uh, a few questions about the why and the how of humanitarian evacuations. If I start with the why, um, we can see that humanitarian evacuations have been seen as a life-saving protection intervention. How does your organization view evacuations and are they seen as a protection tool? Maybe if I turn to Pierre from the ICRC first and then Louise and Brooke. Yes, indeed, evacuation are seen as a last resort and a life-saving operation. Maybe let me just mention that most evacuation that uh, we do in the field are actually related to evacuated wounded and sick, uh, mostly. Um, this is the most usual type of evacuation that we would have, uh, bringing people to a place where they can be treated. The same type of um, guarantee, the same type of uh, uh, procedures would be applied in terms of ensuring, of course, informed consent, security, agreement of the parties, a follow-up, registration, um, all of those different aspects would be there. The family unity, trying to make sure that as much as possible you would have a family member accompanying uh, the person, uh, and in the case of wounded sick, of course, also a responsibility then uh, on the follow-up, and in some cases bringing the people back after the treatment is feasible. So you have um, I would say that the same type of preoccupation that would come, those are the most common types of evacuation that we would do. And they're also life-saving, they're also last resort, um, but those ones, I would say, are often going unnoticed uh, in, many, in many places. The, the mass evacuation of the sort you, you mentioned um, before are more rare, but thankfully this is usually also because uh, something went wrong in the first place if we are speaking of evacuation that are for uh, quite long term um, as a last resort and not of the type that you mentioned, uh, um, the, the fire or the um, inundation or even linked to conflict that you, you have, um, demining or an operation that uh, push people out for a very limited time. But if you are speaking of people having to take the difficult decision to leave their home, not knowing really if they will be able to, to come back and in what condition they will find uh, their home when they come back. This, of course, is, is per se um, a last resort. It's not something that anyone would do uh, as a first uh, solution uh, when uh, conflicts approach. In those type of cases, we are confronted with a series of dilemma. Um, the more time we have to plan, the more, of course, we are able to ensure that the criteria and I think, Louise, you are going to discuss a bit more the different criteria afterwards. I'm not going to, to spell them out all. Um, the more we have the ability to, to plan, the more we can make sure that all of these criteria are fully respected. Um, the worst case scenario is the case scenario, of course, where this is not feasible, where it's a huge amount of people, uh, very little planning possible with the community concern. And this does not discharge the responsibility to try to make everything we can to, to stick to the criteria especially uh, to avoid all the, the um, risk linked to the transfer itself. Um, 
and for them to have a dialogue with the authority to ensure that the people, once they can, uh, would be able to, to return uh, on the safest condition uh, with the different rights, including property, etc., which would be respected. But this is always with dilemma. So once we go in those type of situations, I think that the one thing to retain is that there will always be dilemma. There will be dilemma linked to um, how much are we contributing to uh, actually facilitating uh, military operation of one or the other party out? How much are we contributing or not to education? How much um, are people really willing to, even if the last resort, uh, be a choice, so it's a no choice solution. So there will always be that. It doesn't mean that we don't have to do it. Uh, in some cases, you, you have to, to do it. It's the best option that is still left. But I think we have to recognize in the analysis uh, that um, we have to wait the pros and cons uh, as much as we, as we can. Thank, thank you very much for setting out the dilemmas. Um, Louise? I think your um, question, Simon, is uh, very relevant. I mean, even posing the question is humanitarian is a humanitarian evacuation life saving. I think it's quite. I think it's the cornerstone of the whole issue. Of late, in the last few years, we've been confronted with having to act swiftly, decisively, uh, oftentimes at the request of populations under risk, and found ourselves you know, sometimes asking the wrong questions. Is this necessary? So going back uh, in time, as you rightly pointed out, uh, Simon, there, there are multiple examples of um, having set and trained humanitarian evacuations to save people. And what we wanted to do in the last few years is simply because of the uh, brutality of conflicts today where um, civilians, populations are not just indiscriminately um, affected, but um, sometimes are targeted by uh, actors and uh, to the conflict, we need to be prepared. And I think that's essentially the, the lesson that we wanted to um, ensure that everyone had a firmer grasp of what it takes to actually act decisively to protect people. You need an awful lot of preparation. And I think um, you were right, um, uh, Pierre, to, to underscore this. So in the heat of the moment, I don't think it's time for us to start debating standards, for mm. example. So one of the lessons, recent lessons learned is that in a humanitarian country team, for instance, um, pushing aside the more politicized dilemmas around humanitarian action, at least as a humanitarian community, we need to be clear about what standards underpin our action so that they become the very threshold to even consider engagement. So to be much more concrete, next slide, please. To be very concrete, some of those minimum standards are drawn from the very principles of international law. And, and those are not to be questioned. They need, however, to be understood very operationally by all actors who we then need to coordinate with. Because another essential point of humanitarian um, um, evacuations is that um, they are rarely able to be put into motion without the coordination of many actors. And when I say many actors, not just humanitarian actors, oftentimes political actors, security actors, um, et cetera. Minimum standards, for example, once have led to a much more cohesive understanding of the situation. And I, for instance, you mentioned, uh, Simon, very recently, or perhaps even repeatedly inside Syria, once the humanitarian country team is much more versed about these minimum standards of respect for the rights of people, then we can engage on a discussion uh, in terms of the more operational or protection considerations. In other words, the modalities for setting in train um, a humanitarian evacuation. So are humanitarian evacuations life-saving? They must be. Are they last resort? Well, this recognition that they are last resort is because we have considered other ways and means to try to protect the population uh, in question. Education or increasing um, uh, security presence. Um, uh, and sometimes there comes a time where we need to understand that increasing care and assistance alone 
does not protect people from an imminent risk of attack. So all of this discussion taking place in a very framed and structured, principled way among the humanitarian country team is very enabling for swifter action. And I think just a last point on this, because we do want to go into the more, um, to these operational protection considerations after. Once minimum standards were well debated in a humanitarian country team, be they in CAR, in Central African Republic, or in Syria, for instance, because they're the most recent examples, very quickly did the humanitarian country team feel relieved from um, the concern of taking part in more political considerations or dilemmas. Because when you're answering to an, Im uh, an immediate need to save people, suddenly the political considerations of whether or not we're complicit um, ethnic, ethnically moving um, minority groups, etc., that becomes a very secondary consideration to the immediacy of interceding on behalf of the protection of people. So yes, life-saving, but we need to be prepared. If I can ask a follow-up question, there's um, there's a political risk, isn't there, to preparation for for something like this, and even in ordinary circumstances, sometimes contingency planning can be difficult because you're you're planning for something which you hope doesn't come to pass, or you know the the authorities might get annoyed if you think it will come to pass. Um, and I can imagine a humanitarian evacuation is is really at the far end of the spectrum of something which may be politically unacceptable um, to, to some of the parties in a given state. Do you, um, in one of the examples on the round table, the evacuation took place, but it took time. But now we see that it, um, humanitarian evacuations are taking place more regularly and more rapidly. Mm -hmm. And do you think that um, agencies have taken on board that there is a need to be prepared, as you say, and, and are prepared to accept the political risk. I think that's a fair way of characterizing yeah. this. I think it's, it's been helpful. If infrequent humanitarian evacuations need to be part of mm. what we say, a, a, your protection toolbox. Right. In other words, you have the tools prepared mm. in order to engage. And I think right. that's point number one. Point number two is, um, there have been some relatively clear-cut cases where our dialogue, our presence with communities, have resulted, has resulted in the community itself asking very precisely to be removed from harm or threat way. This, um, this comes from you know, consultation, information, an analysis of needs, that go beyond humanitarian needs, but really an analysis of the threats and risks um, facing their community. Mm. It's relatively straightforward, but as you say, even the, the political um, challenges or uh, nuances there need to also factor in um, um, you bringing the community in harm's way. In other mm. words, the manipulation of communities themselves to change their minds, mm. and we've seen that. Mm. We've seen that happen in the Central, Central African Republic, where suddenly that didn't fit into maybe a more political agenda, and communities themselves then can become um, fractured. Mm. Part of the community wanting um, to be relocated, and the other part staying behind. And then what that means in terms of the protection risks and what you need to have in place for the remaining community behind. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely, a lot of protection risks, a lot of um, uh, risks linked to the political agenda. And at the, at the same time, I think that the answers lie in terms of a very um, good analysis mm -hmm. based on informed and regular consultation with communities themselves so that you can come up with, the, you know, an evidence-based decision-making mm -hmm. is uh, grounded in humanitarian principles, obviously. And Brooke, if I can turn to you about yeah. whether this should be part of the protection toolbox and, and why, 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 would, why would you see it as, as part of a toolbox? Yeah, sure. Um, I think definitely it should be part of the protection toolbox. Mm -hmm. I think actually sort of going to your, the, the second question that you asked, Louise, I think part of the problem with the pushing it off to 
to the realm of last resort in terms of a planning uh, process is that you actually have situations where people self-evacuate because they, they get to a point where there is no facilitated mm -hmm. um, means of, of leaving and, and that that comes with a whole host of risks that had we planned better in advance, we, we might have facilitated a more, uh, a safer um, way to get out of, for people to get out of harm's way. Um, I think it's a very complicated um, tool in the protection toolbox for all of the reasons listed. And I think for um, NGOs, it's quite an interesting position to be in because we will generally never lead an evacuation. So mm -hmm. we are there providing assistance, hopefully, to people who are in uh, a siege area or, or in a place that, they, that they're already under threat. We might provide assistance en route as they're being evacuated out, and we would often be the sort of at the front lines of providing assistance at the destination location. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of the coordination that that takes to ensure that all those steps are, are um, in place and, and fully respect both principles as well as um, respond quickly and, and uh, allow for an actual protective outcome that, that comes from an evacuation. There's a lot of sort of consultation and coordination that's, that's required for that. And I think in terms of planning, it, it is, I think, sort of time and again, we see where that planning doesn't happen, you either get to a situation where you can no longer facilitate an evacuation mm -hmm. effectively, or, um, well, yeah, basically that's what you get to, in which case the risk to the, the population um, is exponentially increased. So um, that's a good link to the, to the following questions. Wow. If, you've, um, if everyone agrees that there, there should be an evacuation, how do you plan for that? And what are the considerations that need to be taken into account? Now, we've heard already that consultation with the community itself and the desire of the community itself, the people being evacuated, I should say, um, is, is critical. Um, what are the, well, how would you go about that in the first place? And then what other steps need to be, need to be taken? And then uh, a secondary question um, would be that um, an evacuation requires substantial operational investment. And how would you, how would your agency go about implementing that? It's quite a logistical problem, isn't it? Yeah, Hello. yeah. I would say when it comes to the criteria, we have a series of criteria. We try to always make sure our respected hands the need for a certain level of planning ahead and capacity to have a presence on the ground to make sure that first people move because they agree to move, an informed consent, um, that there is an agreed upon destination which is safe. It's not evacuating people to a destination which is not sure in itself uh, or a place people don't have any idea where they are really going. There must be, of course, for our part, a clear agreement and guarantees given by the parties, not only uh, for the transfer but also that at destination uh, there is a certain number of uh, things that will be put at disposal, that people will be able to uh, stay there. Family unity, of course, uh, during the evacuation, we be extremely careful not to break that unity. This doesn't mean that the whole family necessarily has to move. You take again the example of evacuating, for example, the wooden the sick and people the most vulnerable within a community, not the whole community. <clears throat> you might always make sure that you have one parent or someone who accompanies uh, the person being evacuated. Um, it's the security of transfer, of course, itself, guarantee of security during the transfer. It's as much as possible, and we know that's where it becomes extremely difficult, is the right of return, uh, to make sure that you negotiate and you have uh, a discussed habit right of return. That's, of course, the one which is often, let's just be honest, uh, uh, the key difficulties that, that we have, and that's hence all the discussion about how much uh, is it really something we should be that easily um, ready to go into. I'm still in the opinion that it's a last resort. So I would still not uh, go for mass evacuation as uh, in the toolbox something we can that easily take out. I think that uh, 
it's already a fa once more a failure in itself, especially if it's a long-term mm -hmm. uh, evacuation. So we, we have to be ready to do it. We have to know how to do it. But um, before that, a lot of other things must have been tried uh, to, to, to protect people where they are um, before, before evacuation becomes uh, the, the best available option. It's always a bad option to some degree, uh, but it may become the best one of the available mm -hmm. one, hence the notion of life-saving and the notion of uh, with a sense of emergency into it. Um, <clears throat> and the documentation, making sure that uh, indeed, especially if it's people who are then transferring to medical facility or that being taken care of unaccompanied minors or others, that you also have a clear documentation of the cases that you, uh, you transmit the case to, uh, to someone who will then take care of the person and then send a follow-up also afterwards. So I think that there is a a list of things we have to put in place uh, in terms of uh, retire to make the uh, evacuation as successful as possible. In most cases, we are able to work on most of those, uh, the return being always the most difficult one. In some extreme cases, uh, we are not able to fulfill all of them. I think we have seen cases where because of restriction of access uh, to places, of, of timing, uh, we are unable to get the informed consent of everyone. Then, of course, it's also about the team on the spot to, to have this sense that uh, mm -hmm. do they spoke to enough people, do they have a sense that, uh, yes, uh, there is, there is uh, a consent that is given by the community even though they couldn't speak to everyone. Uh, so I think there, under the criteria, as much as possible, we should really make sure that we have them, especially if we can plan, especially if it is about uh, small numbers there, if it's about the big mass last minute, then, of course, it, that's the, the, the good sense of the team to see how with this criteria they have to be able to um, to play around. Thank you, Louis. Thanks, I Maybe in the next slide, we've captured um, several of the elements that um, Pierre was discussing just then, and it's not sequential. And mm -hmm. as you point out, Pierre, many of those aspects need to be negotiated and worked on in tandem. And there, the complementarity between different uh, humanitarian actors and local authorities becomes quite important. And really understanding that, um, uh, have a keen understanding of the interests that might be at play. And I say this particularly because I've just mentioned local authorities and in a conflict situation, local authorities and the dynamics with central authorities or other actors need to be really, um, really well understood. Because essentially, all of this needs to take place with continuous dialogue with uh, communities who would eventually be relocated. They uh, need to be informed constantly. Things can change very swiftly. Um, and their appreciation of risks um, needs to be taken into consideration. I can't underscore more the temporary nature of humanitarian evacuation. Mm -hmm. um, in under any scenario, uh, humanitarian evacuation needs to be understood as a temporary measure, hardly a long-term solution for anyone. Um, uh, eventual reestablishment of protection and safety nets, etc. So it's 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 um, uh, the immediacy, the urgency of it, the temporariness of it, then requires a lot of mitigating measures. Yeah, you mentioned uh, documentation, how essential that is. It's essential for people to leave with all the documents at their mm -hmm. disposal, and if they're missing something, that we know what those essential documents are so that we can try to um, uh, mitigate this. I say this in the context of ensuring family unity, and I say this very much in the context of the right of return. And negotiating a safe access or for relocation will require a lot of negotiation, uh, very clear understanding with the receiving community and their local authorities. There needs to be negotiation and agreement guarantees, in fact, received for the safe passage of the communities about to be relocated. There's so many things that need to be considered and in tandem a very deep understanding of the community to be relocated, the, uh, the profiling, and there the profile of people, some things become ever more essential depending on the context. 
The receiving community needs to know also who they'll be receiving so that they are well informed and given informed consent to um, receiving and integrating um, people in the first place. And then the support on, on both ends. And the receiving community will need to have some form of support, political, security, and perhaps even humanitarian assistance support to be able to um, deal with the situation in the, in the short term. And I think I should also underscore the need to not take for granted that all humanitarian actors are prepared or have the right level of experience or expertise. Um, and um, there needs to be some time devoted to ensuring that standard operating procedures are well thought out and understood by those undertaking the humanitarian evacuation. And it uh, would sometimes mean some training. It needs also, and I, I'll stop here because I, we, we could go on and on and on, and hence the, the whole issue of preparedness when it comes to humanitarian evacuations. They're part of our toolbox. So we better know what's in the toolbox to be able to put them in train. Um, I was going to say there needs to be thought to anticipating problems. So once you know all the logistics are in place, Simon, you were saying it's a heavy investment, and it really is. I mean, this is only a very short list of things mm -hmm. to consider. Um, you need to start anticipating what can go wrong. Mm -hmm. How will actors, part of you know ensuring the evacuation, react if um, there's an attack? How will we react if part of the community decides to, at the last minute, not uh, get on board and, and, and be evacuated? What if a political decision comes down and impedes the movement? What if we're stopped on the way? What if someone uh, ends up being quite ill or is, um, is wounded in the convoy, et cetera, et cetera? Preempting means preparing. It doesn't mean we're, um, we're waiting for things to go wrong. We're anticipating, therefore ensuring that, you know what, not everyone needs to be part of um, organizing this humanitarian evacuation, but those that need to play an essential role certainly need to be. So we need to identify who are the best um, people to be able to accompany such a movement. It's complex. It can be done, but mm -hmm. it certainly requires, again, uh, looking at all the parameters. I guess it's easy, isn't it, because of the extraordinary nature of, a, of an evacuation to be caught like a rabbit in the headlight mm -hmm. and forget that, in fact, many of the elements which you have to take into account for an evacuation are things which you should be thinking about anyway, because it's part and parcel of a response to displaced people, including on return, and so those issues which you've mentioned, actually, sh they should be in your toolbox anyway, okay. but you have to adapt them to, okay. to the extraordinary situation in front of you. Um, Brooke, you said earlier that NGOs will probably never lead an evacuation, but, but how, how might NGOs support an evacuation? So I think in all the phases that I mentioned earlier, NGOs can play a role, and in some cases, an essential role. Hmm. Um, I think a lot of times we're in the best position to uh, play the interlocker with communities um, in terms of, of understanding what uh, their interests and, and needs are. Um, you know, we we are in a position to provide assistance both prior to, during, both <laughs> prior to and during, as well as at the destination location. So mm -hmm. I think understanding as an organization where you have added value, and it may not be at all three phases of that, um, and sort of s selectively being involved based on that added value, I think is, is important. So um, the other thing that I just, so it's not, to, I mean, I think we would agree with all the, all the different criteria that have been mentioned and, and sort of the reflection that needs to go on around that criteria. The other thing that I think is important to note are the sort of establishment of decision-making structures and coordination structures in terms of going into an evacuation. I think what we've seen in, in a number of uh, cases in, in the past has been that sometimes those are not as laid out as maybe they could be for uh, the purposes of ensuring things are smooth, for the purposes of being able to kind of react to things that go wrong. Um, and similarly, and, and in some cases where decision-making authority has been kind of granted, 
having ways to discuss things uh, in a more open way and, and make adjustments, um, I think is really important. So there, there's, of course, all the, all the issues around exactly, you know, looking at the needs of the communities, talking with them, understanding um, uh, what they want and, and, and how, to, how to ensure that the evacuation is safe. But I think also from a humanitarian community perspective, recognizing that there are different points where different actors have added value and trying to balance all of that is, is quite a <coughs> significant undertaking. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now we're open uh, the webinar to, to questions from people online. Um, and we have a question from, from Mamadi Diakite. Um, um, Mamadi, I believe you're in Dakar, is that right? Can, can he hear me? No. So the question, what is the question? It's about a list. Okay. Okay. We're going, so we're open for questions. Um, and while we're sorting out um, what the questions are, I'm going to follow up um, a little bit. Um, Brooke, are there any um, considerations which would be particular for NGO involvement uh, in an evacuation? And I'm thinking particularly about political or security considerations which may affect um, how you would support an evacuation. I mean, I'm not sure that it's exclusive to NGOs. I think, I think recognizing that the, that evacuations, recognizing that moving a population en masse can have political ramifications mm -hmm. in any case. Um, and trying to balance that and the life-saving needs of moving a population with the political consequences, um, I think, is something that does need to be thought through very seriously. Mm -hmm. So some of the dilemmas that uh, Pierre mentioned earlier, I think, are, are very much on, on the minds of NGOs in terms of how to engage. I think one of the things about evacuations that are quite difficult for NGOs is it requires engagement with actors that we might engage with less um, in our sort of normal uh, work. Right. And so having to sort of step out of that hat, I guess, and look at, okay, how can we, for the purposes of saving lives, engage with these actors that we would normally try to stay quite separate from mm -hmm. um, and, and effectively ensure that we, we are able to remain principled in the way that we approach uh, the evacuation, but also recognizing that those actors are fundamental to moving the population. Yeah. So I think, I think, like I said, I don't think that is exclusive to NGOs. Right. Um, but I think it is complicated for NGOs, uh, also largely because it's it's not necessarily something that is um, always in the kind of list of things that we that we engage in. Right. I mean, you, you've raised an interesting point about the position of groups vis-a-vis -vis, um, populations and populations who are displaced or, or at risk, and they have a value mm -hmm. um, to, to um, parties to a conflict. Um, now, well, everyone has raised this issue about uh, the need um, for informed consent, the need to assure or ensure that there is a possibility of return. Are there any examples where that has happened or um, is the experience that where a group is relocated or evacuated that it has stayed exactly where it is and, and has never returned? I think we have example of both. We have example right. where it works, people are either with support of different organizations or directly by the authority and on their own will are moving for a limited period of time and able to come back. Mm. Um, and an example where this never really happened. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> either because there was not much to go back to, mm. the destruction uh, that happened while they were away, or simply because in the course of uh, how the conflict evolved, 
um, they found themselves in the impossibility to, to go back. Or maybe some could, some could not. Mm -hmm. So I think we have different types of examples if we look back at, at history. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should do everything we can to ensure that people have the possibility to, to go back. That should really be part of the condition. If it's, I mentioned at the beginning that most of the education we do are linked to medical evacuation. In that case, yeah. usually people are able to go back. There are practices in the vast, vast majority of cases we are able even ourselves to, to bring people back. Um, so in those type of cases, the same with uh, people who are extremely vulnerable that are sometimes evacuating areas while the population otherwise stays, uh, this usually makes it more easy for people to, to go back. The case that are the more complicated one are the case where you have a whole population evacuated, kind of empty an area, uh, and of course that's the one where uh, the question of return is the most um, the most difficult, the most at risk. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would say that's exactly the why it should really be a last resort because we, you mentioned um, <clears throat> how evacuation um, could have a political impact. They also have a military impact in the sense that. Um, the rules of engagement are different if there are population around or if there is no population around. So um, moving the population also, of course, can be seen by one or the other party uh, as a way for them to, to either have more free hand in what they can do, or on the contrary, uh, more restricted in what they can do. Um, and there we should be careful when suddenly one party in a conflict gives order to a population to vacate very large areas of territory because they are going to conduct military operation. Under AHL, this is possible for restricted areas. If there is really a, a risk that cannot be avoided. Okay, evacuation could be um, a solution contemplated, but certainly not for a very big part of a territory where suddenly you could have one or the other. So it is saying now uh, every civilian has to move out of a series of cities because we are going to we are going to fight in those cities. So they're there. I would say we also have in the first place to remind parties of their obligation. At one stage when we see the danger is such that people are indeed in a situation where staying is really uh, life-threatening, then of course evacuation becomes uh, an option back on the table. But, it, but it's, a, <laughs> mm. it's a difficult balance. Huh? I think there we have to recognize that there are, there are these dilemma. Uh, there is no simple black and white answer, uh, except once more for the medical evacuation that you are able to bring people back once treated. Uh, if you move to the, the scenario of mass evacuation of community as a whole, you inevitably move to these very difficult uh, choices. Uh, so far, I think we, we we can say that even in cases where people were not able to, to come back, uh, it was still operation that needed to happen because it was life-saving. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yes, there, there you have the dilemma to, to work with. Yeah. Okay, we have two questions from online. Yes. Okay. Maybe as you read uh, yeah. the questions, uh, Simon, I I would probably add that um, you know what um, sometimes our own assessment of what is life saving or not is actually a point of discussion with communities mm -hmm. themselves. In the case of um, the Central African Republic, um, we've seen people who um, enclaved and at imminent risk of attack were actually displaced people already. In other words, they're not originally from um, that village. And so it's a, to some extent, it's an almost an, an easier decision for them to uh, want to move on. And therefore, the evacuation was done in full uh, acquiescence and fully informed um, population and consultation. In other circumstances, where the community is originally from that area, the very real risk of having their land or houses occupied by others is an equal, if not greater, consideration in their decision-making um, uh, process. So imminent risk of attack, yes, but confiscation of their very means of livelihood is an even greater threat to them. And, Hence, the, um, we come back to, you, you know, we might think that many of these principles and standards are theoretical and it's because we're, ta you know, we're, we keep talking about international law, et cetera, but they're grounded in very 
uh, deep realities. For humanitarians to understand what is life-saving, you need unhindered and, con and consistent access to people. You need to understand why they're thinking or hesitating. You need to understand why they seem to be getting along with the community that they say is a source of threat to them because under the cover or guise of um, having access to labor, it's actually forced labor and enslavement, as we've also seen in some recent situations. So understanding how people assess their own threats and whether or not they see as viable the options that we present, there's often a huge, a huge gap. And just yes. to add on to that, I think on the other end of the spectrum, we need to be very humble about the protection that we promise yeah. from an evacuation. I think that there are many situations where moving a population to another area could have similarly life-threatening consequences. And of course, you take mm -hmm. every measure to try and avoid that. But it, that may be something as well that in terms of understanding what we're walking into with a particular population, what we're sort of, for lack of a better word, selling in terms of why they should evacuate, that we need to be very um, modest in, in our, our um, promise of, of protection, I think. Okay. Thank you. So. Um, we have a question from Elisabetta Bruma, who is our um, protection cluster coordinator in, in Damascus. But, yeah, but while we're um, deciphering the, what the question means, Elisabetta, just bear with us for a moment. And um, we have a prior question from Sonia Zdorovsov, um, who's asking about the political issues. Um, and she's picking up uh, on one of your remarks, Louise. I don't know if you want to clarify. Um, she says that you talked about the political issues which should not be discussed during an evacuation. And uh, the question is, what, what do you mean by that? And could you give examples? Um, if I wasn't clear, I, I'll at least attempt to be clear. Yeah. I think we need to be pol politically aware, but not politicize what is fundamentally non-political and it's people's sense of protection. And when you start talking about what you need in terms of protection, I think that's the best and most enabling way to depoliticize the situation. It doesn't mean that the actions taken or that ensue from this are not going to be used or interpreted politically. And so factored into our analysis as a humanitarian community or as we negotiate with different actors that need to be involved, we need to be aware of all of these things. For instance, and I think perhaps this goes to your question, Sonia, you know, how are humanitarians going to be perceived in undertaking a humanitarian evacuation in situation A, B, or C? Understanding how we're being perceived leads us to taking different actions from messaging to negotiation to ensuring that guarantees are publicly known, for example, to mitigate any misunderstanding of the reasons why we're undertaking a, a particular action. So I think we, we, all conflicts are steeped in politics. This, that's, that's what they are. Um, but um, understanding our role in depoliticizing something, I think, goes really to the core of our role in protection. I hope okay. that's a bit clearer. Yeah. No, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, um, you've all mentioned um, the need for registration and, and for follow-up and documentation, um, also to um, assure uh, the possibility of return um, at, at some point. Is there um, any way that new technologies can assist us um, with tracking people with the registration of their needs, but the registration of their rights to property, for example? Um, if any one of you wants to speak to, to that issue. I think when it comes to um, mass evacuation, for the time being, we have tested mostly, I would say, our own capacity on the ground to discuss with individual community, register them, um, understand um, their willingness to, to, to leave, the necessity to leave, and as you mentioned, the, 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 the reasoning that some people might have to decide to leave while others might have to stay. Um, we haven't yet tested uh, 
a way where this could be done um, remotely through um, internet or other other solution. Uh, so I think this is something we we need to to think of. We 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 haven't done it yet. It's it wouldn't become the preferred mode of action. I would still hope that we are able to access people, to have a direct discussion with people, to be able to register them and follow them with, with a direct contact. I think this is, we shouldn't aim to replace that by a way where people can kind of self-inscribe for evacuation and self-register them safe and well after evacuation. This being said, in areas and in circumstances where we are unable to do our work under normal circumstances uh, through a uh, presence and this discussion, could there be substitutes, either for everybody or for a sample of people uh, that would then be able to register um, both their willingness and then um, their, their safe arrival, maybe also with possibility to, to give information what happened, uh, what they witnessed, etc. Yes, I think there, there is margin to have a reflection on how some tools could be developed, which is a reflection we have in general, I would say, in many of our activities. And, how to bring through technology a capacity for people to be more active also uh, and more have a constant dialogue with us uh, through, through those tools. So I would see that this could also be applied to case of evacuation. It hasn't been done yet, not by us, but to my knowledge, not by anyone. Uh, it would be a tricky one. It would be a very tricky one, let's be honest. Um, but it's something that is really worth to be, to be thought of for the future because indeed I can foresee situation where we will be um, in the impossibility to really make the work as we should and as we would like to do in presence and accompaniment and where possibly other solutions can substitute for part of it. Uh, thank you very much. We've, we've had a little bit of um, trouble getting questions on the field because of bad connections. Um, but we, we have um, a question here about how to address the guarantees um, or to protect civilians uh, that may not agree to evacuate. And I think the question is linked to the possibility or the fact that sometimes evacuations are not conducted by humanitarian actors. So mm -hmm. I guess they might in fact be conducted by a party to the conflict it, itself. Um, so how in that situation do you um, get the the agreement of the people to be evacuated, and how do you? How, what can we as humanitarians do to assure the rights of people in that situation? Sorry, just to clarify, you're talking about people who want to evacuate. Who don't want, who to, don't evacuate. want to evacuate? I think I think the question is there. There are elements, many elements to the question, but it's all one question essentially. So. So far, we've been talking about evacuations that are being conducted by humanitarian actors, but there may be situations where they're not conducted by humanitarian agencies or supported by humanitarian agencies. And what, what is it that we can do in those circumstances? Maybe I can, I can start. I think, uh, well, firstly, uh, I mean, again, reality shows that um, the request for evacuation can come from multiple sources. It can come from communities. Um, it could come through an assessment of humanita by humanitarians. It can come from parties to the conflict or the state, a local authority, a central authority. And while this is a consideration for understanding what we need to negotiate because again, I go back to one of my earlier points, you need to understand the interests at play to be able to then well position yourself to represent what it is that you're supposed to be representing. You're representing two things. You're representing humanitarian principles at play and you're interceding on behalf of people. You're representing the protection needs and the protection requests of people. And if you're unable to express this or put this forward in a meaningful way, I think it does put into question your ability to even engage in the operation. So the possibility of non-engaging is there, and that's, this is probably done on the basis of very basic humanitarian principles, whether or not our neutrality, our independence are going to be at play. Secondly, that the very rights of people are going to be fully respected. In other words, there's not going to be any compromise over 
those minimum standards, the earlier slide that we um, put up for you, the second slide, um, and I, the, the very basic standards of respect and rights of people. For example, if it's a, it's, if it's a, a common practice or you can anticipate that uh, people will be deprived of documents or families will be separated, that young men will be taken separately from um, other people and, and, and the civilian character of the evacuation won't be, won't be respected. I think those are all preconditions for humanitarians to even consider engaging. So the source of the request might be at play, but I think more fundamentally it's about framing the role that you anticipate playing and what you represent in, in, the, in the evacuation. Thank you. Maybe I yeah. can just add one thing. I mean, I think, I think by the time you get to the point of considering a mass evacuation, you're talking about a list of bad options. Mm -hmm. And I think there is, I mean, we also have to respect if people, you know, people have the agency to say, it's not, it's not my preferred option. And that may mean that they are, they are taking on certain risks. The reality is they'd be taking on certain risks by agreeing to evacuate as well. Um, so I think there's, it sort of doesn't happen in a bubble that you would evacuate people. You'd be looking at other ways of assisting in addition to that for both populations, both the population that stays behind as well as the population that agrees to move. Um, and so I, I think it's, it's a little bit difficult to make it a either or. And I think in cases like this where you have a non-humanitarian actor who is um, organizing, coordinating, leading the evacuation or insisting on it, I think even more so in those cases, we would need to look at, at how to support the alternatives that people are choosing. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have uh, another question from, from the field, um, which is about the particular needs of, of people um, either living with a disability or a debilitating disease. Um, and the example raised was about HIV. Um, and I, so I, I guess, how do you plan for that so that there is a continuity of care um, in, a, in an evacuation? Part of the, the preparedness, sorry, maybe I just did to think. Part of the preparedness is um, about, um, you know, we mentioned the necessity of having a, an adequate profile of people. Uh, to understand the specific needs from children to older people. And it, indeed, for people who have specific needs in relation to their health or even their, their protection. So choosing partners who um, have something to contribute to ensure uh, that the evacuation is done safely in a dignified way extends to health partners and health support. And the consideration has to be um, made to the receiving end, at the receiving end. Um, not just access to services, but fair and non-discriminatory access to essential services for the population. And indeed, some of those some very specific parameters are sometimes very difficult to predict, but preparation would at least entail a discussion with um, uh, uh, people at risk um, in terms of the limits, the limits that the uh, humanitarian evacuation might, might entail. Also, what we have faced in many cases, not when we speak of a total evacuation population, which is still a very rare mm. occurrence, mm. Uh, where relatives are, um, but when it's mostly about the wounded and sick and maybe the most vulnerable within that community, is to be clear first on the criteria for the evacuation, um, so that really in the community also there's an understanding why some people would be evacuated by you while some others would not. And then to make sure that, um, based on those criteria, indeed on the receiving end, uh, you make sure that people have access uh, to the different support they, they need. Um, to which degree would they be able on their own to, to get that access? Or to which degree are they really totally relying on you uh, mm -hmm. to get that access because they cannot? And it's something you have to pre-plan. I think this is a bit of case to case, depending the type of uh, situation they find themselves. But you have a responsibility to make sure especially if you take care of the most vulnerable, that you don't just drop them, which I think no, none of us is doing. 
uh, but really to make sure that then there is a follow-up through time. And the, the through time is important because although, yes, it should be only for a short period of time, experience also show that in some cases this short period can, can last uh, longer than what was thought first and hence the, the need to make sure that we have registered and we can follow up these people. Um, in most cases, we are able to plan and we are able to do things well. I think there is these few cases where we are unable to do so uh, today and where I think it's challenging to make sure that uh, those type of cases would come, come out and that we would really be able to, to follow them. Okay, thank you. Um, Brooke, did you have any further thoughts? No, I agree with everything. Okay, great. Um, are there any, there's another question from, from online? Yeah. Okay, I will just read it. Yep. So it's uh, the young consent. Could you elaborate more on best practices to advise on how to ensure the persons being evacuated are adequately informed of the evacuation process to come? The level of de detail that you would recommend giving? This is in the context of having observed an evacuation where it was found it's very useful to inform of the duration of the journey, steps to expect along the way, what would happen upon arrival, the availability of medical staff at different stages of the journey. All this to enable persons to better anticipate what is to come, but also having observed where such information was not provided, resulting in confusion and worry. Well, we've got um, just a couple of minutes to go, so if I can um, maybe reduce the question to one about um, how do we ensure proper information is given uh, to people. I can start with that. I mean, I yeah. think that in general, the more information that's given in the largest variety of ways, the better. I, I think that the um, also taking into to consideration the population that you're talking to, how they access their information, um, how they communicate among each other, all of those things need to be accounted for. But I think, um, yeah, the, the goal would be to avoid confusion. I don't think you want to add that level of, of complication to something that's already quite a complicated process. I think similarly, it's important for us to have uh, information about about uh, you know what kind of information they need, what kind of information they want, what what they have already, what um, so that we can we can um, tailor the information that's available uh, before, during, and and after an evacuation um, to ensure that that, that 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 it is informed consent in the the most um, real way that uh, that is possible. Um, I think in general that, that the, the leading would be towards as much information as we can give. And there's quite a bit of good practice, I would imagine, from natural disaster situations yeah. where where information is, is absolutely critical. As I mentioned, the California Dam evacuation earlier, 200,000 people evacuated in a short space of time. And I think maybe that's the one, right. for your new technology question, that, right. that may be some place where we need to, th I mean, on the one hand, I think we need to think about new technologies. On the other hand, I think we need to also think about places where going back to basics is going to be the best way to, to communicate. Okay. So perhaps to conclude this panel, yeah. would, would the panel recommend that all countries that are experiencing an armed conflict at any level um, prepare for humanitarian evacuations as part of their contingency plan? That's a yes or no <laughs> answer at this stage. I would be very uncomfortable mm. with a yes and no answer because once more I think that, especially if you are speaking of mass evacuation and not evacuation of wounded and sick or categories of people uh, with specific vulnerability. But I think if you are speaking of the yes, I would advise that this you have clear procedure put in place, agreed upon authority with referral hospital, maybe with referral. Um, receiving home for elderly or other categories of people where you could envisage some evacuation. But if you speak of the mass evacuation, that's why you have to be a bit prudent because if you give the signal you're ready to do it too easily, mm -hmm. but yes, you're also giving a signal that actually it is okay to say to the population of a city where you know there is going to be fighting to evacuate to allow the use of uh, 
uh, force that would not be allowed otherwise if population is still there. And I don't think that's the type of message we, we want to mm. give. Um, so it, it, it's a, mm. when to start this discussion in advance enough to be able to still have some planning and to avoid to be in a situation where it's all last minute uh, versus starting it too early to then give an impression to the parties that it's actually okay to set the whole population move on, we are coming in to fight. I think that there, um, the yes and no answer is honestly not mm -hmm. the way I would, I would try to frame it. Mm -hmm. uh, being prepared to do something is different and needs to be different from maintaining that humanitarian evacuations are a last resort. Mm -hmm. So being prepared is a great thing and it needs to be part and parcel of our experience, the lessons we learn uh, throughout uh, one operation to the, the other, and that's why we're having this discussion, that's why the GPC can be table not too long ago. We need to check in regularly on those difficult operations to carry out, but it doesn't mean that they become routine or any easier or any less uh, uh, complex uh, given the different uh, uh, situations. I would, um, and coming back a little bit to the previous question, linking it to this, you know, we, we, you need to relay information that you know is credible and real. You need to relay what has been relayed as guarantees, and you cannot start venturing into suppositions or promises that you have no control over implementing. And I think that's the real essence of a, a meaningful discussion and an informed consent of communities um, rest. Yeah. Really quickly, I just I feel like there are there are markers where you start to see that an evacuation may be an option that you would need to consider, and so it's not in every armed conflict, but that you would be able to say, you know, you start seeing enclaves, you start seeing sort of strategy military strategies that that put people at very uh, high risk in terms of. of uh, places where they're living, and that's the point at which at least the conversation about preparedness would need to begin and contingency planning. Um, but but it would be based very much on, on starting to see some of those markers. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all we have time for in this uh, webinar. That was a very rich discussion, so I'm not even going to try and sum it up, apart from to say, be prepared, I think is the main <laughs> message. Thank you very much everyone online and to the panelists.